You have to create that fear and dependency simultaneously. We know this about any abusive relationship. In any abusive deadbeat boyfriend or dad, you have to create fear and dependency simultaneously. That's what they have done. But what does Jesus say in Luke? Let it not be with you. Who is the greatest? The one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I, said Jesus, I come among you as one who serves. No, it's true. So you, church, you go actually serve. You actually exercise mercy. Don't let them take your strategy and counterfeit it by pretending to care about the people to accrue power. Well, welcome back to Culture and Christianity. This is our attempt to acknowledge that we can't live our faith in a building separate from the world around us, that our faith has to engage the culture. That's the assignment to be salt and light, not to be light salt. And I think we've been confused for a while. So there is no shortage of topics. I like to talk about the theater of the absurd. And they continue their releases. They are on display before us um, from the law that was signed in effect in California, forcing schools to keep gender identities of students a secret to the steady number of abortions to the Democratic National Committee thinking it's a good idea to roll a abortion bus up to the convention and celebrate the abortions committed every day. It's just unbelievable. So my guest today is, I I think he's going to be able to find some facts to talk about this. Seth Gruber is a friend. Welcome back, Seth. Thanks, Pastor Allen. The founder, president of the White Rose Resistance. Yeah. You are, you tell us about the 1916 project. I know while we're talking, but you have been a voice for life. Yeah, since I was and a fetus. For that, I want to thank you. So welcome back. Saving babies since I was a baby. Because uh, uh, her body, her choice. So every part of the baby's part of the mother, blob of tissue, my body, my choice, not our body's my choice. Because the theory that comes along with abortion rights requires you to filter out of sight the recognition of any separate human being bearing injuries that are lethal. So according to the law of transitive properties, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. So every part of the baby is not a baby because it's a blob of tissue because it's like a polyp and that's why abortion is health So therefore, every part of that thing in the womb is actually the mom's body. That's why they say my body, my choice, which means I was my mother's body, which means when she was waddling around the pregnancy, Center in 1991, loving on moms and saving babies as the executive director of a pregnancy resource center in Los Angeles County. Every baby she saved, I saved. So I have been a pro-life activist since I was a fetus. I'm impressed. Yeah. Most of us like wait till we graduate from school, but you just started early. (laughs) Well, as you will discover as you listen, Seth not only has an opinion, he has, he is well armed with the facts and the data. Uh, I, I think we ought to jump in with the Democratic National Convention yeah, because they've decided man. as a cold-blooded calculation of votes and politics that they can make abortion the centerpiece of their platform to consolidating power in this nation. If that's true, the judgment of God is next. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, sa- Sacrificing uh, human beings, uh, like human sacrifice to get political power, not a new idea. There's nothing progressive about secular progressivism. It's all very regressive, okay? Um, It's like ancient neo-pagan revivalism, kooky, like occultic Gnosticism, demon worship, actually. And that's why I'm such a fan of Christian nationalism. Because when you rip Christianity out of society, guess what? We don't all get coexist bumper stickers and find some utopian live and let live, like— pluralistic society where everyone's idea and religion and worldview gets an equal say. No, we actually just go back to demon worship. Nature abhors a vacuum, rip Christianity out of a culture. We don't become less religious. Our religion just becomes more pagan, kooky, weird, and demonic. Okay? So that's why Christian nationalism is better than secular globalism. And Christianity yesterday, Christianity never, Christianity today um, needs to go and just go off. Just go die. Okay? All of our major big evangelical sort of institutions have failed the church. Mm-hmm. Because they've made peace with the spirit of the age. I think it was Fulton Sheen who said um, that those who um, those who make peace with the spirit of the age will find themselves a widow in the next. I have not heard a Bishop Sheen quote in a long time. Fulton Sheen. Yeah. Good job. 
homeschooled. Homeschooled, baby. Homeschooled, Pastor Allen. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, right now the Democrats at the DNC, which, isn't that funny, by the way? At the DNC, they're trying to do DNCs. Now, it's, <laughs> it's actually medication abortion, but DNC is dilation and curatage. It's a way to kill babies in the womb. The DNC doing DNCs, I just thought that was sort of sick and weird. But but they're doing medication abortions, um, which was responsible for 63% of the murdered babies last year in 2023, which, remember, that's the first full year since the overturning of Roe. So the, the, the very first year that follows the overturning of Roe, the American people are just more bloodthirsty. And that we had, we had the highest number of abortions reported last year than we've seen at an annual rate in about 10 years. That you you take you start to take away a little bit of their Moloch rights and they just are more bloodthirsty. So I, 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 I tell the pro-life leaders going around saying, Roe v. Wade, overturning Roe v. Wade has saved so many lives. We're saving lives. Stop lying to people. Okay, all that means is some states reported less numbers because their resident women went over state lines into a Democrat blue state and killed their baby. The numbers are higher, but you just have something less to report in your red state. It doesn't mean that babies were saved following the overturning of Roe. Now that will continue to happen moving forward and we're gonna tear down every high place and we're gonna establish federal protections for the unborn child by banning at every state level as spirit-filled men and women and Christians are running and getting elected and establishing righteousness because someone's religion and worldview will be dominant. We're going to do that. This is the beginning of the pro-life movement, not the end of the pro-life movement. But we have to acknowledge the theological, spiritual aspect of all that's happening. All the Democrats are saying right now, what are they saying, Pastor Allen? They're saying this election will be a referendum on abortion. That's it. And so but, now they're literally killing babies at the DNC just insert, to win elections. Because, uh, because it's being cast so frequently as a political issue. Mm-hmm. And churches won't talk about it because it's political and we're not allowed to talk about politics. <laughs> the problems we're facing are not fundamentally political, they're Amen. spiritual. That's right. Because when the law changed and abortion was no longer the law of the land and it wasn't forced upon us any longer, mm-hmm. abortion numbers have gone up. Yep. We have a heart problem. And when Roe was turned back, we didn't hear the churches shouting and celebrating. Mm-hmm. We heard the people complaining. The protests against that were greater than the celebrations on behalf of pro-life. That's right. So for all of my Christian church-sitting friends that are listening, we have to have a heart change. We've got That's to right. use our voices. That's right. It's not enough for Seth Gruber to set his heart hair on fire and run around the country <laughs> yeah, yeah. saying this is bad. Well, I, it's, my job is to put myself out of a job, Pastor Allen. That's always yeah, been man. the goal of the white roots resistance. Well, you've been working on it since you were a fetus. Could you get on with it? for? Uh, That's why I have all these gray hairs now. <laughs> it's your fault. You had me out here at your conference. It is my fault. Four people wanted me to come speak. And so was, you know. My, my wife can scream at you for expanding my platform, but uh, sorry. we love you. We're so One grateful for you. One more wife screaming at me. <laughs> um, so have you ever heard of a guy named Carol Quigley? No, I've heard of Quigley Down Under. Does that count? Um, by the way, that's one of my favorite movies. <laughs> Tom Selleck at his yes. best, right? Yes. And and Alan Rickman, one of the best Hollywood vic- uh, Hollywood villains ever. Yes, that's true. That is such a good movie. This is we should not, do, you and I should do a movie night sometime. This we is should not watch Dodge that City. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I want that Sharps rifle. <laughs> when, when, yeah, here we are. We're saying pro-gun is pro-life, which, by the way, it totally is. The reason that we should carry guns is to protect the innocent against evil men. Mm. And that's why it's, it actually is, is a pro-life um, belief system that should make you want to buy guns. Now we just triggered every lib. We have on YouTube. We have thoroughly. But, but I want I, I wanted to ask you about this because I thought this is a, this is an incredible story and it, it actually connects to the 1916 project. And and by the way, if I just completely like steamrolled your notes and interviewed no, no, you, can just good. interrupt me. Okay, okay. Um, I want to be respectful because I have so much respect for you. So Carol Quigley, this guy, okay, he mentored um, um, Bill and Hillary Clinton. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, Carol Quigley um, began in the 1960s, began work on what became his his magnum opus. It was a massive tracing of what he called the Anglo-American establishment. Um, it, 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 was, it was called Tragedy and Hope, uh, A History of the World in Our Day. It was due to be released by Macmillan in 1966. And um, th- 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 this is kind of sort of the foundational roots of organizations like the Trilateral Commission and the Committee for Foreign Relations. And he wanted to create a history of this extraordinary movement. And he traced the ideas of what he called the Anglo-American establishment to the ideas of Antonio Gramsci. Now, Gramsci or Gramsci, people say it differently, um, he would be kind of the intellectual godfather of cultural Marxism and the Frankfurt School, the Frankfurt School in Frankfurt, Germany. But now, now, ever heard of critical race theory, theory, CRT? So critical theory comes out of the Frankfurt School, right? Um, And so Gramsci, by the way, um, he went afoul of Mussolini and spent the rest of his life in prison. And he wrote and read voluminously. 
we have his prison letters. Those prison letters kind of became the basis for the creation of the Frankfurt School. Now, the listeners right now who go, I thought this guy was a pro-life, that we shouldn't kill babies. Uh, yeah, it turns out you have to deal with the worldviews that have animated this culture of death if you That's want to true. tear down and reverse engineer so the sexual true. revolution. So for you guys listening, you're like, just tell us not to kill babies. Uh, we need to level up, okay, our intellect and IQ a little bit and be able to deal with this, as Schaefer said, not in bits and pieces, but in totality. So, okay, those, those are my primer. So so uh, you get this guy, Gramsci, who, whose prison letters become the basis for the creation of the Frankfurt School and really the strategy of cultural Marxism um, and what Gramsci called the strategy of the robes. What he meant by the strategy of the robes was um, if we can get the robes of the academia, the robes of the courts, the robes of the scientific organizations, (laughs) Fauci, and the robes of the clergy, um, then the revolution can happen without guns because we can change the culture. If we can, if we can alter the foundations of culture and the fundamentally cultural, uh, culturally formative institutions, then we won't need riots in the street to usher in the Marxist utopia. So, uh, Gramsci's prison letters were translated into English a few years ago for American leftists to research, read, and study. They were translated by an expert on Gramsci here in America. His name is Professor Joseph Buttigieg. His son is a certain Mayor Pete Buttigieg, okay? So when when people say like, hey, I think Pete Buttigieg, our our transportation secretary, who says we have racist highways and byways, I think he's just a Marxist, fact check true. Okay, that actually runs in his blood. Um, So, okay, so then some of the German Jews at the Frankfurt School, Pastor Allen, they feared Hitler because some of them were German Jews. So they moved the Frankfurt School to Columbia University. Okay, and they, they, they became the fathers of the radical hippie movement and the radical yippie movement. And later they became tenured professors at American universities and so put the sexual revolution on steroids. Okay, so that's Gramsci. Well, Carol Quigley writes this book tracing kind of the strategy of the Anglo-American establishment. Today we would call it the deep state. <laughs> okay, um, and he traced the ideas to Gramsci. His book was due to be released in a massive public relations splash by Macmillan in 1966. The books get to the warehouse. And then all of a sudden, the members of the Anglo-American establishment, who he was writing about, decided that the book was premature, that it exposed the plan too early, that they weren't ready for it. And so all of the books were destroyed. Coincidentally. Two boxes, because a warehouse worker wasn't making an ideological decision. He was like, wait a, wait a, wait a, wait a second. (laughs) They put millions behind the marketing and PR splash for this whole book. The books are here and now you're going to burn them all? Uh, And so he sneaks two boxes out to like sell them and create an inheritance for his kids or something. Well, my mentor, Dr. George Grant, who's an advisor on the film we're about to talk about, the 1916 Project. And by the way, everything I'm saying right now connects to the whole strategy of the sexual revolution. They took our strategy and they flipped it upside down. And that's why the culture of death looks like what it does and why we have such a weak, impotent pastors and churches in America. I'm going to connect it all. It's going to rip your face off. But anyways, so my mentor, Dr. George Grant, he has one of those original copies. No way. From that warehouse. Now it's been it's been it's been republished in some bootleg editions. You can kind of get it now. But those original copies, there was only a couple in those first couple box. And, and so um, it, w- there was nothing particularly incendiary about it. It wasn't like some like master QAnon, like, you know, globalist Klaus Schwab, Schwab plot. Right. It, was, it, was a, it was a pretty straightforward history about how the cultural Marxists decided that instead of burning down Minneapolis and Ferguson, instead of, instead of creating a police-free zone called Chaz Chop in Seattle, uh, th- they decided that that wasn't working. It, the, these, these cultural, because there were a series of Marxist failed revolutions in the mid 1800s, late 1800s. And so the cultural Marxists decided these things aren't working to usher in the revolution. So we need to change the foundations of culture. That was basically just the tracing of this book. But the members of the Anglo American establishment said, no, it's not too soon. Don't expose the plan. So that's basically the book. And, and, and it, it's a fascinating read because Quigley traces how this long term strategy was to unfold in the major institutions of power, that it would be funded by Wall Street and it would, it would fundamentally alter the foundations of culture. He understood that the battle was always a battle of worldviews. And this is what Gramsci understood as well. According to Quigley, One of the key elements of this plan was a concept from the Frankfurt School, from Gramsci, from all the cultural Marxists and critical theorists, and it was called enforced coercive toleration. Really fascinating kind of term. Let me say that again, because this is like kind of weird, weird stuff to trace all this. 
enforced coercive toleration. This was an idea that was uh, developed by Herbert Marcuse. Now, Herbert Marcuse was one of the fathers of the free love movement, along with Wilhelm Reich. Herbert Marcuse, by the way, he once said, uh, for, let's make this theological, shall we? Because all human conflict is ultimately theological, to quote Har- Cardinal Manning. Um, he, he once, um, uh, well, where was I? Marcuse? Oh, yes. Yeah, Herbert Marcuse once said that the way back into the garden is to take another bite. Oh. Of the fruit, Jeez. of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah, is this political or is this spiritual? That's one of the that's one of the disciples of the Frankfurt. Herbert Marcuse came from the Frankfurt School. And he said, the way back into Eden, the way back into perfection is to commit the original sin again. Defy God again. Okay, no fear of God. Flip God off again. Again, well, Herbert Marcuse later later discipled a woman named Angela Davis. She's still alive today. She's an anti-white racist. She's a critical race theorist, systemic racism. Everything is racist. 1619 Project. Um, Guess who Angela Davis mentored? Not only Nicole Hannah-Jones, who authored a book called The 1619 Project, she also became the mentor, Pastor Allen, to the co-founders of BLM Incorporated. Alicia Garza and Patrice Colors. Have they been better at secular discipleship than we have been at pure and undefiled religion to raise up the next generation to be dragon slayers? Without question. I think so. So Herbert Marcuse developed this idea of enforced coercive toleration. It was one of the key aspects of the Frankfurt School. And, 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 and the way that, that Quigley writes about this idea is that he said, what this means is you use mercy or the appearance of mercy to win the hearts and minds of the people. You use compassion to win their hearts. Um, now, what's interesting was that Gramsci, um, uh, he, he had studied Christianity. He had studied the Bible. In, in fact, in fact, Stalin and one of his henchmen, Vladimir Karchov, had studied for the seminary. Before they abandoned Christianity, Stalin, the Soviet leader, yes, yeah, and, and one murdered of his, hundreds of millions, yeah, exactly, of people, yeah. and one of his henchmen, Vladimir Karchov. But now, so they left obviously Christianity, and they they abandoned it for radical Bolshevism. But they had studied the New Testament; they knew these stories. In fact, Vladimir Karchov, Stalin's henchman, um, he actually in 1923 and 1924 took over all of the charities. So counseling services, food banks, soup kitchens, anything that could be determined to be charitable, the state had to take over all of those things because the state can tolerate no rivals for the hearts and minds of the people. They won't. Use mercy or the appearance of mercy to win the hearts and minds of the people. And so what did they do? They took our strategy, flipped it upside down, injected it with demonic principles, and they have been more effective at their demonic religion and secular discipleship than we have been. So they knew the story in Luke, uh, Luke 22, Luke 2, no, Luke 22. Um, And the the, um, kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, And those in authority over them call themselves benefactors. You you pretend to be the benefactors of the people. But that's not real mercy. That's not real compassion. That's not real love. That's not real sacrifice. This this is how they've changed the culture. What I'm trying to say is they're the ones who write the stimulus checks. Right. They're the ones who, if you're on Medicaid, they make sure you get your free COVID jab. They're the ones who take care of you in times of crises. And there's always got to be a crisis, Pastor Allen. There's always got to be a crisis. You have to create that fear and dependency simultaneously. We know this about any abusive relationship and any abusive deadbeat boyfriend or dad. You have to create fear and dependency simultaneously. That's what they have done. But what does Jesus say in Luke? Let it not be with you. Who is the greatest? The one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I, said Jesus, I come among you as one who serves. No, it's true. So you, church, you go actually serve. You acts 
actually exercise mercy. Don't let them take your strategy and counterfeit it by pretending to care about the people to accrue power. What's my whole point? We knew that this was their strategy for a long, long time. And when someone tried to write about it, who was in agreement with the strategy, they said, bury that. Don't let that get out. Margaret Sanger is probably the most successful, secular, sexual, cultural Marxist revolutionary of the 20th century who perfected the strategy of the robes better than maybe anyone else in the 20th century. They took the biblical strategy of actually being the benefactors, actually caring for the people, and made it fake. And Margaret to trick Sanger and win the hearts of the people and then screw them. And what did she do, Margaret Sanger? For oh, yeah, those she that founded this organization called Planned Parenthood. Yeah, that's the one. The best funded nonprofit in human history, the largest abortion provider in the world, the largest provider of the pornographic comprehensive sexuality education. Right. I want you to tell them about that in the context of your new book and your movie. But So that's what we're exposing. Yeah. And we're waking up the church to reclaim her strategy of actually exercising. But what mercy. I want to be sure the people listening are recognizing is that it's when we talk about abortion or we talk some about these cultural challenges that we see, the roots of that really are spiritual. That's right. And they're not brand new. They didn't happen in, since since COVID or the shutdowns or the lockdowns or the manipulations of Fauci. Mm -hmm. They have been present with us. I mean, as you're telling that story, I go back, one of the most, you know, there really aren't any new heresies. There's only about four that have plagued the church from the beginning. And Pelagianism was one of them since the fifth century. That's a distortion of grace. It says every human being because of the grace of God is valuable and we don't really have to be repentant, Yeah, which is what you're describing. They, they bring this forced tolerance and forced manipulation, mm -hmm. but good. you are packaging it, I believe, for a generation to hear it in a new way. Yeah. And so that's a little bit, let's take some time and talk about that. Yeah, you yeah. have a book and a movie, yeah. the 1916 Project, yeah. which really lays bare Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood that's right, yeah. and that initiative. And in a great deal more detail, the ideological principles that are behind it. Yeah. It, there's, there's just simply no way for the church to be silent in the front of this and mm -hmm. imagine you're the true church. Amen. It's impossible. Yep. And don't sit in a church that won't call abortion sin. That's right. Amen. Because if you are, you become a sponsor yourself. Your silence that's right. makes silence you culpable. Silence equals consent. Yes. Yep, that's right. So tell us about your project. I yeah. know they're, they're yeah, releasing you. as we're sharing this podcast. Well, the reason it's important, Pastor Allen, <clears throat> is because God says in Hosea 4, 6, my people are being destroyed for lack of knowledge, which means it was like actively happening. Like you're being destroyed right now. We are being destroyed right now for lack that's of true. knowledge in the American church. And I can say that with some authority, Praise God. I don't, I'm not sure how all this happened, except for the the grace and love and kindness and support of a couple guys named, I don't know, Pastor Jack Hibbs and Charlie Kirk and Pastor Rob McCoy and you. But I've been probably in more pulpits on the issue of life on Sunday mornings um, in the last four years than probably anyone in the world. And so I've just had the cool honor of being able to be in all these states and all around the country in different cultures, right? Because America's so it's diverse. It's also hard work for, yeah. <laughs> for full disclosure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the number one response I've gotten from these brave churches is, uh, Seth, I, I, I never knew. I never, heard, I never heard any of that before, Seth. And obviously, the churches that are having me, Pastor Allen, they already are like pretty brave, right? Like you. Like it's not like Stephen Furtick at Elevation Church is letting me in. Like even if I was wearing Yeezys, like I wouldn't be able to go preach at that church. You know what I'm saying, right? Like it's like I could speak as well of Charles Stanley as I, as I possibly could. I wouldn't be allowed in the parking lot of Andy Stanley's church. So like the fact that I'm at these churches at all means they're super brave and bold, right? And they they educate their congregation. So For what they I'm fear saying, God. That's right. Yeah, Amen. Let's just start I'm, with I'm that. saying it's the brave, courageous churches that that come up to me after in the, after a tr and Sunday, and they say, "I never heard any of that before." And that's when I realize, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, we are being destroyed for lack of knowledge. And that's why the sons of Issachar in First Chronicles are so significant. They, they, all the all we know about them is that they, they were men who understood the times they lived in, and so they knew what Israel ought to do. That's it. That's all we know about them. So with an understanding of the times comes a responsibility and duty to act. And that's that's why we did this project and film, the book and film, The 1916 Project. The book is called The 1916 Project, The Lying, the Witch, and the War We're In. The Lying, the Witch, and the War We're In. Um, comes out, it came out September 4th. You can get it on our website or on Amazon, but give your money to a Christian ministry, not baby-hating Christian-hating So Amazon. what's your website? The 
1916project.com, the 1916project.com. But we open with this scene in the middle of 2020, and you'll remember this, but not very many uh, even conservative news media outlets covered it. So remember Nicole Hannah Jones, 1619 Project, not not my 1916, y'all, you to make sure you heard me correct. The 1619 Project tried to link every societal. Uh, every allegedly form of societal ill in the 21st century to the racist heritage of 1619 when the first black slaves came to American shores. By the way, if you're listening to this right now, it's like a special on Hulu right now. (laughs) It's like a multi-series thing on Hulu right now. But Nicole Hannah-Jones, who was mentored by who? Angela Davis. Who was mentored by who? Herbert Marcuse, who said the way back into Eden is to take another bite and defy God again. Okay, so that, yeah, cultural Marxism. So she's a purple-haired Marxist. I don't say that to be rude or mean. She actually, like, no, no, seriously, like she actually has purple hair and she's actually a Marxist. And so she publishes the 1619 Project at the end of 2019. It becomes K through 12 curriculum in many public schools in America. It's unbelievable. This is why some of y'all watching this remember social media viral clips of like a 10 year old white boy being forced to apologize to his 10 year old black friends in a public school by the public school teacher. Why? Because even though he's white and he loves his black friend, because of the dint of his skin, he participates in systems of oppression. Pastors so far as Tim Keller have said this publicly, by the way, and that's going to tick some people off. And I don't care. He, he, I have a clip of Tim, Pastor Tim Keller saying, if you have white skin, you participate in, in oppression and in evil, even if you're not a racist individual. So they've been very effective in the strategy of the robes of even getting the clergy. Okay, so, so she writes this thing. Nine months later, George Floyd. So what was every leftist waiting to scream as a rationale or explanation for that event? Racism. They had been taught that, that that was the only answer to every form of evil, allegedly, because of the 1619 Project. It's a special on Hulu right now. Let me say that again. There's indoctrinating a generation of people to hate America because what? If the seed or the roots are racist— then the tree's racist too. And you can't actually trim racist twigs off and redeem the tree. If the seed and the roots were racist, you have to burn the whole thing down. And sometimes they did. Courthouses and police stations defund the police. They actually burned it down. It's not just a metaphor. Um, and so then, then we have to cancel everything that's racist, right? So Aunt Jemima, the syrup lady, she's bad. That's racist tokenism or whatever. They, they went after any corporation or institution or company that they said had vestiges of racism. And no, then- true. They went after Planned Parenthood. Now, you may have known the phrase, the revolution always eats its own. This was not conservative pro-lifers that got Planned Parenthood to cancel their founder. We've been saying this for a century. Chesterton was saying this back in the 1920s. Like, we know all this. But they carried water for the liberal establishment, for Sanger. In fact, Hillary Clinton and Nancy Pelosi got the Margaret Sanger Award. There's a bust of Sanger's face at the Smithsonian. Like, they explained away her legacy. They justified it, and they ignored the critiques of conservatives. And then, because pro-abortion, BLM Incorporated, Antifa, cultural Marxism, Frankfurt School, strategy of the robes, starts eating its own and going, they went to Planned Parenthood that summer of 2020, and they said, your founder, Margaret Sanger, was a racist and a eugenicist. And I'm like front row seats, lots of butter on my popcorn, extra large Dr. Pepper, hilarious theater. I was like, this is so funny. Might have been a little bit of my flesh there. I'll need to repent of that. But like, it, it was like, I was like, you can't make this stuff up. And so the Planned Parenthood of New York, they have a mega center in Manhattan, a mega center. Guess what it was called? Sanger Center. The Sanger Center. I'm just guessing. So they took her name off the building. And then on the corner, it was called the Margaret Sanger Square. And so New York City took that sign off. So New York City canceled Sanger. Planned Parenthood canceled Sanger. And so interestingly enough, it was the disciples of the 1619 Project who said, everything is racist and we have to cancel anything that's racist. It was them, not conservatives. It was them that got Planned Parenthood to do what conservatives couldn't do for 100 years. Acknowledge that your founder was a racist, eugenicist, Hitlerian, Nazi-esque piece of garbage. And then, but- Tell us how you really feel. Don't hold back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what does critical race theory say? It says if the seed and root and are racist, you can't redeem the tree. But did they call for the defunding of Planned Parenthood? Did Planned Parenthood go gently into that good night? No, no, no. They basically said, yeah, our roots are super racist, but our tree is going to keep growing. And we're going to keep doing the things that Sanger started doing, including her thing in 1939. It was an initiative of Planned Parenthood. What was it called? Oh, yeah, the Negro Project. Not what I call it. That's what Sanger called it. So I I looked at this and I saw almost no one covering it at the time. I'm like, 
If they've lied to us about their patron saint, what else have they been lying to us about? What is the real history behind the sexual revolution, behind Margaret Sanger, behind the history of Planned Parenthood with the best funded 501c3 organization in human history and the largest abortion provider in the world and the second largest provider of cross-sex hormones and puberty blockers? That's right. Trans drugs for teens is now Planned Parenthood's fastest growing revenue stream. So say Hmm. say it again. I don't want them to miss it because we think they tell us that Planned Parenthood is for... Pap uh, smears and breast exams. Women's health. Yeah. And they're the largest abortion provider. The and world. now they're the second largest provider. Of chemically castrating transgender drugs called puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones for America's gender-confused youth. And they're they the second federal largest funding. provider. How much last year? $700 million. $700 million of our taxpayer dollars last year in 2023. So that's just the beginning of the history of Planned Parenthood. Um, here's, here's, a little, uh, here's a little teaser vignette. Oh yeah, we're still good on time. Um, is the founding board member of Planned Parenthood was part of the KKK. Now, what's so crazy about this, if you go on Google and you just Google this stuff, you'll find this guy's name. You'll find that he was part of the KKK. You'll find that Hitler loved him. But guess what's hard to kind of find? The Planned Parenthood. Yeah, the fact that he was a founding board member. Yeah, they lost that with the assassination attempt on Hmm. Trump. All those got lost in the same dump. That's interesting. So Orwellian, by the way. Those who control the past control the present. Hmm. So, um, yeah, go read 1984, okay? And, and so um, this guy, his name's Lothrop Stoddard. Kind of a weird name. A Lothrop, Lothrop Stoddard. He, he even has like a Hitlerian kind of mustache. It's slightly wider than Hitler's, but like only by like a, a, like a little bit. I'm not kidding, it's super weird. And so, so um, he writes this book called The Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy. Did he get kicked off the board by Sanger? Oh no, he held that position for years. And then he wrote this other book. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say, he was the exalted Cyclops of the Massachusetts KKK. That was the phrase that they would give to like the Grand Wizard. He was called the exalted Cyclops of the Massachusetts KKK. If you're listening to this, by the way, you're like, the Mass- Massachusetts had a KKK chapter? Oh, yeah. And the exalted Cyclops was Sanger's board member, financier, friend, and guest writer for her magazine. Okay. Okay. So he writes this other book called um, The Revolt Against Civilization, The Menace of the Underman. That was the, that was, and you go, okay, who's the underman and why are they a menace? That was the, that was the title, The Menace of the Underman. Well, for him, the underman was black, Slavs, Italians, Jews, and the mentally and physically disabled. And they're a menace, right? Because we have to create the ubermenschen, the superhuman, the super race. So we got to get rid of the untermenschen. Oh, wait, that wasn't that the title of Heinrich Himmler's famous Nazi propaganda book, Der Untermensch? Mm. Where did he get that phrase, Untermensch? Historians believe that they did not begin to see the use of the phrase Untermensch, Pastor Allen, until the German translated version of Lothrop Stoddard's book, The Menace of the Underman. And I recently found online, because I'm a weird ADHD intellectual homeschool research nerd, I found the German translated version of Lothrop Stoddard's book. There was one copy available online around the whole world. It was $350. It shipped from Europe. I had to wait forever to get it. We have a picture of it in the movie, in the movie, The 1916 Project. I have it. Sure enough, the German term for menace of the underman, underman. How did they translate underman? Untermenschen, the title of Himmler's famous Nazi propaganda book. And and that phrase didn't begin to be used. Uh, They got it from Lothrop Stoddard. Margaret Sanger's founding board. Okay, raise the hands, all the Christians who love Pastor Allen. Who's ever heard that the Nazis got the term subhuman from Margaret Sanger's founding board member of Planned Parenthood? We have been lied to for years about the history of bad ideas, at least over the last 120 years, because the history of those ideas actually indicts the entire liberal establishment today because they walk in the same political and philosophical trajectory or stream of those ideas. And it's very easy to recognize that when you understand the ideas that have animated the sexual revolution, the strategy of the robes of cultural Marxists who took our strategy and flipped it upside down. It's the Great Commission flipped upside down. Himmler later said, Heinrich Himmler later said, that Lothrop Stoddard's book, The Menace of the Underman, for him, for Himmler, became the blueprint for the creation of the final solution. So Hitler loved um, Lothrop Stoddard so much. Let me say it again. The founding board member of Planned Parenthood, I will say it over and over again, that they invited him to the Third Reich in 1939. 
He traveled there, met with Himmler, Joseph Goebbels, Fritz Sauckel, Robert Ley, and Adolf Hitler, and wrote about it in his book, Into the Darkness, Nazi Germany Today. I'll stop now because everyone's going like, I can't handle it. You're fire no, hosing no, me. But, the- but uh, we've just scratched the surface on wh- really who the actors were and their ideas and their worldview that was driving the creation of Planned Parenthood from the very beginning. I mean, Margaret Sanger said things like, um, the marriage bed is the most degenerative influence in the social order. And so like, don't, don't think evil. Planned Parenthood is just about killing babies. Like she hated marriage because it's the foundational building block of society. That's what every Marxist thinks. That's why Hitler, uh, there's a phrase over a gas chamber in Auschwitz, Pastor Allen, and it's, it's a quote attributed to Hitler over a gas chamber in Auschwitz. And it says, I want to raise a generation of young people devoid of conscience, imperious, relentless, and cruel. Um, Hitler would say things like, I don't care about my detractors um, because I have your children in my schools. And so, of course, Margaret Sanger would say the marriage bed is the most degenerative influence in the social order. Well, when you this, listen to it, this it's is demonic. just the beginning. Of, I mean, it's ungodly. Of demonic. how we're living through what we're living through today. And if we keep following the path, we will descend further and further into savagery. I mean, it's it, there's no question. So, the movie. If somebody wants to see the full the movie, how do they find it? Yeah. So you, uh, this comes out the first week of October. Okay. Streaming online for the world. And we intentionally did that right before something significant happening in early November. I'm forgetting what's it. And uh, and so, and the book came out September 4th. Um, but we decided because the White Rose Resistance, my ministry, Pastor Allen, is really by and for the church, by and for the church. In fact, we're, we're launching White Rose Resistance chapters all around the country now, keep helping the church rebuild our heritage of Christian resistance against the spirit of the age and his acolytes and to give God a reason to show America mercy. And so we decided it was important to let churches screen the film first. So any church in America right now, we're having hundreds of churches screen it, can go to the1916project.com and you can press host a screening. If you're a pastor, Christian leader, a Christian school, you can host a screening of this before it comes out the first week of October for the whole world. And then the book, um, because I could have made this film two and a half hours, I, we had to make it 75 minutes and everything else that I wanted to say, I put into the book and the book goes way deeper. That's called the 1916 project, the lying, the witch and the war we're in, um, endorsed by you, pastor Jack Hibbs, Eric Metaxas, John Cooper from skillet. Um, who did I leave out? Kirk Cameron, um, lots of Charlie Kirk, Abby, but Abby I'm thinking Johnson. 75 minutes of you talking is like a four hour movie. <laughs> I mean, that's not normal pace. So, <laughs> But so anybody Once you see this film, you, you'll understand that it can swing elections. Anybody that hears this can go to the website and do a screening in their church. Yep. That's an amazing opportunity. You don't know what to do. You want to feel like you can do something. How do I make a difference? That's a great place to begin. Educate your people. Yep. And so now we've launched a White Rose chapter, Pastor Allen, in Boise. We just launched one with Pastor Jack's church in Southern California. We, we launched in Denver the end of August. We're launching in Fort Worth, Texas in this month of September. And then um, we're trying to launch in Florida before the end of the year as well. And now there's people wanting us to launch all around the country. And what we're doing is we're actually like, we're going to be hiring regional coordinators. who are going to run these, mobilize churches, train them, because this is the job of the church. Unless the church flatulent becomes the church militant, it will become the church irrelevant. We have been asleep at the wheel. The reason we have so many pygmies in our pews is because we have so many puppets in our pulpits, said Leonard Ravenhill. And boy, has that ever proved, that has has never proven more true than in the last few years in America. As goes the shepherd, so goes the church. As goes the church, so goes the family. As goes the family, so goes the country. As goes the country of America, so goes the world. We are to be the stewards of the truth. And we worship someone called the way, the truth, and the life. Now, this is culminating not just in chapters, not just in resistance building, not just in churches taking back life in the country, but we're doing something next June that if your schedule changes, I'm going to bring you out to, but you already, someone snagged you before I could snag you. And it's called The Last Stand in Southern California in June of 2025. But we already have the website, thelaststand.com, if you guys want to go get if information. I'm in the United States, I'll be there. Thelaststand.com. Pastor Jack, Eric Metaxas, Ali Bestucky, John Cooper from Skillet, Danny Goki. Um, we're trying to get Tucker Carlson right now, but it'll be 10,000 people in Southern California. We're going to pray. We're going to worship. We're going to repent as a nation. And we're going to mobilize to launch a hundred new chapters to mobilize the most powerful organism for change in the world, the blood-bought bride of Christ. We're taking back June. Amen. June is not Legion month or Pride month. It's life month because on June 24th, 2022, when Roe versus Wade got overturned, as, all, as everyone else is lighting the... the 
stupid White House and rainbows, and every corporation is being pressured to hang a rainbow from their building or fire anyone that is a cisgender heteronormative bigot, otherwise known as a normal American or Democrat from 20 years ago, Roe versus Wade got overturned. And it got overturned on the day that Christians celebrate Mary going to visit Elizabeth. It's called the Nativity of St. John the Baptist. It got overturned on the day in the church calendar where we celebrate two unborn babies, one of whom is God. We're taken back June and we're only two years old and we're now the fastest growing pro-life organization in the country. And I think God's blessing us because our goal is the church. Well, my guest today is Seth Gruber. You can go to the1916project.com, get the book. You can get a link to the movie. I think as I listen to you and and you and I have talked about this many times, the thing that I think is so important is I don't believe this is a 10-year project. I don't believe we have a decade to process this. Mm. I I think we are at a hinge point and the church will either stand up and do what we know to do or we will forfeit our freedoms and we will pay the price that comes with a descent into paganism. That's right. There are other chapters in history where the church failed. That's right. And there was great suffering, and the suffering is disproportionately targeted at the children. Always. And if we think abortion is heinous, if if we don't stand up to protect the unborn, what was going to come to the living children among us that's right. will be equally heinous. Well, that's because those who murder the unborn cannot be trusted to govern the born. So, and those who murder the unborn will one day murder you too. And every single one of us that, that tolerates the sacrament of Satan. It's time for us to respond. So it's culture and Christianity. You got to live your faith outside the pews of the church. You got to take it to work. You got to live it at your kitchen table, at your holiday table. And outbreed them too. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. Don't forget that. That's true. Actually, we should close your show the way we began it. The DNC is offering free sterilizations and abortions at the Democrat National Committee. This is a dark thought for your listeners. And I don't celebrate any child that is aborted or murdered. And I want to ban it at the federal level and criminalize it. So let me be very clear. However, I'm simply saying that if things continue the way they're going and nothing changes soon in the short term and things don't go our way in November and the church continues to remain asleep at the wheel, I'm simply saying that the long-term strategy is to outbreed them. They might literally sterilize and abort themselves into extinction. And maybe we should go back to Genesis, that one commandment of being fruitful and multiplying, filling the earth and subduing it, exercising dominion. Former Indiana Governor Mitch Daniels was once asked, how do we beat the libs? And Mitch said, well, it's kind of difficult because they're pretty crafty. So you can try to out-strategize them or outthink them, but it's kind of difficult. Or you can outbreed them. And I would recommend the latter because the latter is more fun. But do it in the covenant of marriage. Find yourself a man or a woman who's the opposite sex of you. Marry them. Give yourselves to Jesus. Have a ton of babies. Find a community of Christians that are supporting one another. Not living off the grid, but like supporting local. Don't buy from Amazon. Don't fund the Bill Gates machine. Have a ton of babies. Raise them in the admonition of the Lord. Homeschool you some babies and then raise you a generation of dragon slayers. And as one of my friends, Pastor Douglas Wilson says, why would you raise a generation of dragon slayers and then complain that there are dragons out there for them to slay? We'll close with this quote. Somebody sent it to me last week. If the church gave counsel to King David today, when he heard Goliath bellow his challenge, they would say they should pray for him and not cause a scene. (laughs) God help us. (laughs) Thank you, Seth Gruber. (laughs) Thanks, Pastor Hal. (laughs) Hey, thanks for joining me today. Before you go, please like the podcast and leave a comment so more people can hear about this topic too. If you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe to Alan Jackson Ministries' YouTube channel and follow the Culture and Christianity podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcast. Together, let's learn how to lead with our faith and change our culture. I'll see you next time.